Coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. Nothing's new under the sun, but if there is going to be a new right, it needs to harken back to some obvious uh, larger scale kind of structural principles of what you can do with a political party in the United States of America. And, you know, I mean, the, the that nationalist side of the Whigs did live on. And uh, we, <laughs> I mean, I mean, we have a lot more to talk about in this podcast. Welcome, everyone, once again to The Roundtable, the editor's and publisher's podcast here at The American Mind. I'm your host, Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute, publisher of The American Mind and the Claremont Review Books. I'm joined by James Pullis, executive editor of The American Mind, Matthew Peterson, founding editor of The American Mind and vice president of education, Spencer Claven, associate editor of both the Claremont Review Books and The American Mind, and Seth Barron, managing editor for The American Mind. Well... We wanted to open this week. It's not new news. It was announced a couple weeks ago, I think. Uh, we even speculated on whether it would actually happen. But Afghanistan, we're pulling out September 11th. Uh, I wanted to just offer a couple of samples here and put some historical institutional context in place for us. We were uh, mostly, and I'll read some from him, but mostly in, from Angelo Cotovilla, we were skeptical of this venture from the start here at the Claremont Institute, and especially at the Claremont Review Books. And uh, Angelo's critique has held up pretty well, I think. We were, uh, I mean, part of the part of the criticism was that uh, whatever else was true about Afghanistan, you know, the the problem of Arab terrorism was not necessarily have all that much to do with the Taliban in Afghanistan where that graveyard of empires in that quasi country uh, is really not much of a country, unlike say the real players in the global terrorism game, that is real sovereign states with real ability to uh, move funds around and host banking and, and all that kind of thing like Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iraq, elsewhere. I'm not commenting on the wisdom of invading any of those places, Iraq, uh, first and foremost, but that was part of the argument. So let me just read from Angelo. Now, he wrote this. This is from our Victory Watch series, which launched in the fall issue of 2001. So I think it had been maybe a month and a half or so since the war started. And Angela wrote the following. This is um, just a couple of pages, but worth, worth digesting. The Taliban are mostly irrelevant to America. Typically Afghan, and unlike the regimes of Syria, Iraq, and the PLO, the Taliban have little role in, in or concern with affairs beyond their land. They provide shelter to various Arabs who've brought them money and armed help against their internal rivals, but Afghans have not bloodied the world. Arabs have. The loyalty of the Taliban to their Arab guests is of the tribal kind. The moment that the Taliban are under serious threat, they probably will give the foreigners up. But absent the complicity of someone where... Of someone where bin Laden may be hiding, it is inconceivable that U.S. intelligence would find bin Laden's location and dispatch special forces that could swoop in, defeat his entourage, and take him out. Um, Angela wasn't quite right about that, but it took uh, uh, 20 more years, 19 years. Um, and it's still, uh, there's still an open question about how exactly, um, what real role, you know, zero dark 30 to the contrary, not, well, notwithstanding what real role, you know, fantastic CIA agents had in uncovering that rather than the Pakistanis deciding it was in their interest to, to turn him over. Uh, sorry, Angelo here again. It is surprising that no one has yet lured the U.S. into such an operation and into an ambush. Destroying the Taliban regime in Afghanistan was always the only way of getting bin Laden for what little that is worth. From the beginning of U.S. military operations in Afghanistan on October 7th, the lack of strategy for ousting the Taliban was evidence of incompetence. Since then, obvious changes in the character of operations belied U.S. spokesman's claims that the war is on schedule and confirmed that those who planned the operation made no intellectual connection between the military moves they were making and the political results they expected. During the first weeks, U.S. actions were limited to bombing fixed targets, mostly primitive air defenses and mud huts, unrelated to the ongoing civil war in Afghanistan. Only after it became undeniable that the only force that could make a dent in the regime was the Northern Alliance did U.S. bombers begin to support the alliance's troops, but tentatively and incompetently. 
all war colleges teach that bombs from aircraft or artillery are useful in ground combat only insofar as they fall on enemy troops so close in time to the arrival of one's own infantry and armor that they render the enemy physically unable to resist. Whether in the two world wars in Vietnam or in Kosovo, whenever significant amounts of time have passed between the bombs falling on defenders and the arrival of attackers that defenders have held, the Afghan civil war is very much a conventional war. Nonetheless, U.S. officials began to take seriously the task of coordinating bombing and preparing the Northern Alliance for serious military operations, only after more than a month of embarrassment. In the initial days and weeks, the operation was a show of weakness, not strength. Just wrapping up here with two more paragraphs. The U.S. government's misuse of force was due to its desire to see the Taliban regime lose and the Northern Alliance not win. Impossible. When the alliance did win, the tribal nature of Afghanistan guaranteed that the tribes that stood with the losers would switch sides and that they would sell to the winners whatever strangers were in their midst. This, however, underlined the operation's fundamental flaw. Just as in the Persian Gulf War, the objective was so, was so ill-chosen that it could be attained without fixing the problem for which we had gone to war. We could win the battle and lose the war. Hence, the worst thing about the campaign against Afghanistan was its opportunity cost. Paraphrasing Livy, Machiavelli tells us, the Romans made their wars short and big. This is the wisdom of the ages. Where war is concerned, the shorter and more decisive, the better, provided, of course, that the military objective chosen is such that its accomplishment will fix the problem. By contrast, the central message of the Bush administration concerning the, quote, war on terrorism is hardly distinguishable from that of the Johnson administration during the Vietnam War. This war will last indefinitely, and the public must not expect decisive actions. In sum, the Bush administration concedes that the objectives of its military operations will not solve the problem, will not bring victory. Whatever its incidental benefits, the operation is diverting U.S. efforts from inconveniencing any of America's major enemies, and it is wasting the American people's anger and commitment. And 20 years later, we finally acknowledge that uh, the Biden administration is going to close up shop and get out. Uh, a nice little coda to that from Angelo, which was in 2001, is this, this recent Politico piece where a, a soldier who's written a book, um, uh, Eric Edstrom, he's written this book, The Un-American, A Soldier's Reckoning of Our Longest War. And he has a, a, a piece, summary piece in Politico, just a few poignant paragraphs. So he's there, he arrives in Afghanistan six years after Angelo wrote that. Uh, and we uh, we see the, the wages or the fruits of that uh, um, incompetence here in his description. It took less than a month, however, after he got there, to realize that America's war in Afghanistan was a complete disaster. On the ground, I participated in a mission nicknamed Operation Highway Babysitter, in which the infantry secured the road, allowing logistics convoys to resupply the infantry, all so that the infantry could secure the road so that the logistics convoys could resupply the infantry. Worse, whenever a road was blown up, since protecting all the roads all the time was impossible, American forces would pay exorbitant cost-plus contracts to Afghan construction companies to rebuild it. It was common knowledge that many of these companies were owned by Afghan warlords, guilty of human rights abuses. In turn, the construction companies paid a protection tribute to the Taliban. Then the Taliban would buy more bomb-making materials to destroy the road and U.S. vehicles. We were, indirectly, but also quite literally, paying the Taliban to kill us. Well, good riddance to that fiasco. I wish Trump could have gotten it done. He was scheduled or supposedly to have it done by May of this year. Uh, Biden's now pushed that to September. Uh, we can't get out soon enough, in my opinion. <laughs> I mean, I keep returning to Helen Andrews' insight in discussing, I think, Jeffrey Sachs, that book, Boomers, that these were people who were building an empire, but they couldn't admit that that was what they were doing. So they couldn't refer to any of the classic wisdom about building an empire of the kind that Cota Villa makes reference to in that first piece you read, Ryan, I mean, it, it, there's a weird parallel here for me between reflecting on this war and uh, reflecting on the legacy and ongoing efforts, so-called philanthropic efforts of Bill and Melinda Gates, who have been in the news a great deal recently. This couple that basically, you know, airdrops pallets of contraceptives into Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, where as uh, Obi Anuju Ekeocha is fond of pointing out, this is a completely foreign attitude about sex, a Western, late modern Western attitude about sex. I mean, these are imperial ventures. And and as Angelo indicates, right, when the Roman 
empire undertook such things, they they made certain to do so with and, and to make no bones about it. If they were at war, you were with them or against them. The you know the way that they swept across uh, the sort of subsidiary leagues of the Greek islands is a classic example. But the way that they dealt with Seleucids is another. And and this way of doing war, doing business uh, in the name as as Angelo points out of these kind of abstract concepts against terrorism for democracy only works if you have a real conviction that those are things that you believe everybody must obey and you're going to make them obey. We don't have anything like that conviction. We barely have a conviction that we ourselves should continue to exist as a country. And in fact, we're you know now adopting, it seems, a national and international policy that the way we have made our country is bad the way we run our country is bad and so to go about like you know then attempting to export this thing that we are now excoriating ourselves over uh in this sort of haphazard half-hearted way proves itself again and again to be just you know really appallingly wasteful of american time talent treasure and life and really of you know of, of the best of us right we send people who are devoted to this country, who do have patriotic commitments, who, as P.G. Keenan has pointed out, right, like believe in America and uh, have, a, have a deep loyalty to whichever endeavor the leaders of this country decide upon today. And it's a crying shame. It's a it's a terrible shame that we do this. We send these people to die for causes that we don't even believe in. Well, I was going to talk about Liz Cheney, but since uh, since uh, Spencer has broken the seal, uh, I'm going to talk about Seleucus instead. Uh, Seleucus, of course, the heir of sorts to Alexander's empire. Uh, most of it, in fact, stretching from the eastern approaches of the Mediterranean clear out to, I guess, the River Oxus or thereabouts, um, the uh, the the Himalayan foothills. Uh, a very large empire, um, very successful empire, as these things go. In fact, it. It lasted for so long um, that it managed to peacefully spin off a couple satellite empires um, of historical interest to some people, um, one of which was the Greco-Bactrian Empire, which lasted a good 300 years, uh, clear into the, the time during which Christ was walking the earth. Uh, there was also briefly a, an Indo-Greek Empire that did not last as long and uh, was a little bit more unstable. Um, the point being, uh, even back in the day when uh, people complained that Afghanistan was uh, the graveyard of empires, I winked at them and said, not my people's empire. Um, <laughs> but the point is... Get your Greco supremacy out of here, James. That's right. Of course, they're all thinking about, um, about the, the, uh, the ill-fated Soviet invasion <laughs> right. of Afghanistan. And uh, as we all know from, was it Rambo 2? that was dedicated to the brave fighters of the uh, Mujahideen beginning. I think it was Rambo too. The, uh, the U S support for the locals was uh, at least helpful in uh, beating back the Soviet onslaught. But what has stuck with me even more than the film was the speed with which the Soviet union passed into history on the heels of what could have been a successful invasion for them. It was apparent at the time that the USSR was struggling. Um, and once the war in Afghanistan, their war in Afghanistan came to an end, uh, it really became obvious and, um, and the Soviets were not long for this world, uh, leading one to wonder if Americans are going to find themselves in a similar position where there's going to be this big moment of fanfare and all of the you know organs of the mainstream press will all come out with these front page reports and you know big fonts and like extended commentaries on television about the you know 20 years to the day after september 11th 2001 america comes home and it's going to be this huge production um and in some ways you know it is significant um and in other ways it's reminiscent of you know those like time life tabloid magazines that are always there that have like the Beatles on them or princess die and it's like instant boomer kitsch and just like paralytic nostalgia and uh once all that sort of blows over um which might happen very quickly depending on how things shake out uh then americans are going to be left to sort of look 
at their immediate environment. And they're going to have to look at, you know, the fact that 20 years have gone by. And for lots of Americans, lots of Trump voters, they've been watching their country decay year after year after year. People who were 21 years old in 2001. And then they look around now and they look at their lives and they look at their country. They look at what's happened to their friends, their children, their parents. And it's just sad. It's just wasted time. And they are left to pick up the pieces. And, you know, I'm not here to, to prophesy that the government is going to fall as quickly as the <laughs> Soviet Union collapsed after they finally beat it and withdrew from Afghanistan. But in some ways, you know, like we see that this regime of ours is <clears throat> just as belligerent and yet just as weak as regimes of the past that have tried their hand at Afghanistan. And I hope that it's going to be, that's gonna be the real reality check. And that's gonna be sort of the realization that sets in after this very, very lengthy misadventure finally comes to an end. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with you there, James. Uh, and the, the idea of pushing forward the departure of the troops to have matched the 20th anniversary of 9-11 just seems like just absurd and grotesque and, you know, comedy. I mean, history repeating as comedy or, you know, some grotesque form of comedy. But it, it seems to me it's going to be like, it's really going to be Biden's mission accomplished moment in a way, like when Bush was standing on that aircraft carrier and, you know, the banner that said mission accomplished. I mean, this is clearly like a defeat, uh, and it should rank with like you know uh, the helicopter leaving the the um, the embassy in Saigon as just a, another example of imperial overreach and American hubris. We never should have been there, and you're right. What, what what's the legacy of this 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 adventure? Probably like three trillion dollars, five trillion dollars in treasure squandered, thousands of lives, a, a horrible opioid epidemic, uh, a, a, a huge suicide rate among veterans. Um, it, it's amazing to think that America went ahead and repeated its Vietnam experiment and did an even worse and more bungled job. And when we leave, you know, so much of the, the rhetoric over the last 20 years has been about girls' education in Afghanistan, and that's why we need to be there. Uh, and, I mean, is, it, is there anything more predictable than, than that all, any kind of advances in, like, Kabul girls' schools are going to be just unwound, like, immediately? It, it, the whole thing is just sad and depressing, and it, it does seem like it's, you know, when the tale is told, this will be, you know, one of the great signs of our unraveling. It's almost hard to, it was so long, it's been so long, it's hard to believe it actually ends. And I think, unlike Vietnam, which became a flashpoint, this was more um, a real deep symptom of de decline because there is no image of, right, the helicopters leaving um, the, the kind of indelible burning in the American soul that uh, media provided for Vietnam with a, you know, a lot of people who were upset in powerful places. It's it just gone. This is just a wear down. It's a long, decades long wear down of just being used to a kind of new normal and as I'm listening to you guys talking, I'm thinking, you know, for all those who are over 40, probably, um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine an America that didn't have some kind of fortitude and pride in its military. But if you're younger than that, and this is your conception of the U.S. military, which also wokeified over itself over this time, it's a large bureaucratic failure, and it's been nothing but failures for decades. 
And I think there's a profound difference. It's so viscerally tied into what you think your regime is, right? What your military is. Um, it's tied to the what you what we, the goodness of your regime or the excellence of your regime. It's a basic um, necessity to have some kind of fighting force. And if from the time that you grew up, that force was was something of a failure or mismanaged and, and bungled these large bureaucratic tasks that that never really worked out and and ultimately ends in, end in failure. At the same time as, um, you know, I, I've heard so many stories of, of friends who were over there as, and you'd hear about how, you know, the military was corrupting itself and going woke a long time ago. And, uh, you know, morale, I mean, so many problems came out of that. And what's, what's really disgusting, I think, is that we didn't have a, a leftist media this whole time. There was some of this in Iraq initially, uh, but th that may, part of the media changed, and I think that's sad too. So there's no there's no real chronicling of all the people who whose lives were changed for the worse because they they were in the military over the last twenty years. We just ignore these stories, and and all of all of us have them. I mean, I, a friend of ours, um, very sad case, came back from um, from a few tours of duty and ended up committing suicide. I mean, suicide is an enormous problem. Uh, over the last 20 years in the military. And so it, it's just, it's it's not as neat and clean as the kind of burning pictures of Vietnam. It's just one long slog that suggests a, a decline and a very unhealthy regime. And it's unbelievable to have lived in a time period when, you know, that was that was not the case. There still was victory. There was um, a sense of of pride in the military and I mean, it's gone. I, I think it's just gone. Yeah, the grim statistic, Matt, is, uh, and we all know it here. I'm not pointing anything to you that you don't know, but we've lost more more soldiers, veterans to suicide than we have to Iraq or Afghanistan. It's uh, remarkable and depressing, as Seth said. Well, it'll be, you know, it'd be interesting to watch. Um, there's this kind of rump of the GOP, mostly never Trump, who, you know, Bill Crystal, Liz Cheney. Etc. Who continue to say, uh, you know, continue? They're, they're really the only constituency for just staying in Afghanistan forever. I guess. I mean, uh, you know, they're happy to defend a Max Boot. They're happy to defend girls going to school as well as, you know, somehow defending this twenty-year occupation as the the real reason we haven't had another attack here at home. It just seems absurd. Well, speaking of large woke bureaucracies, the CIA. Uh, <laughs> so I had, uh, it'll be released in a couple weeks, but I, I had Mark Blitz in here. Um, we were talking about his book yesterday and, um, or maybe it was the day before. No, it was yesterday. And uh, he he brought up his books about philosophy and liberalism and, you know, deep think stuff. But uh, he brought up the remarkable, we were talking about wokeism and he brought up the remarkable fact of uh, our progression from say the se the 70s in Vietnam and CIA as the kind of epitome of of um for the for the new left back then the epitome of of an evil bureauc heartless managerial but nonetheless evil bureaucracy and now you know the cia has this video out that i think many of our listeners have seen if not go check it out but i mean it it the immediate reaction by people who weren't quite on the wavelength of our current moment was this has to be a joke like this cannot be real but i mean it's basically makes the case and it's voiced in the first person by, and I'm not joking here, this is pretty much it, by a wise cisgendered Latina who's like 34 or 35 uh, and how you know her pitch about why the CIA is so great is because it lets her live her lived experience. It lets her be herself. Uh, it lets her feel her identity as a, as a, as a Latina or a Latinx. And, uh, you know, it's an inclusive, wonderful place. And, and um, that's why you should all be a CIA, a CIA analyst. It's like a two-minute video, complete with what, for lack of a better term, is just jargon from the academy on identity politics issues. I mean, it's not surprising to us, I think. The CIA and the NSA over the last few years have, you know, fly the rainbow flag on, on, uh, on Gay Pride Month and all, all the rest. But... Uh, uh, when when you don't think we can descend even farther into what should be parody, the bottom drops out and our ruling class, you know, just keeps going.
Well, you pointed out, Ryan, on the Substack, on uh, American Mindset, in your piece, Making the World Safe for Intersectionality, right? There was this, you kind of weathered a Twitter firestorm for pointing out that more and more of our kind of military institutions, intelligence institutions seem designed essentially to export sort of hyper academic, extremely arcane, very Western specific ideas about sexuality, about personhood, about selfhood. Right? And this is the flip side of what we were just talking about in Afghanistan, this sort of, uh, listlessness, this lack of conviction, this empire without any empire, right? That On the other side of that, you have, as we have chronicled at the American mind, uh, sort of ad nauseum, you have the rise of a new religion, which very firmly does believe in the universal rightness of its premises. It's been called relativist or postmodern, but it's really not, or at least not anymore. It's, it's thoroughly devoted to a idea about, you know, endlessly autonomous selves to a supremacy of races and genders and sexualities. And, and they're quite dedicated at home and abroad to enforcing this vision of the world, right? I mean, this is like, we, we've been chided, some of us on the right, for complaining about forever wars because the neocons will tell us, well, this is just the messy, the messy business of peacekeeping. And what is meant by that is that if you do want a global world order, ultimately you have to back it up by force. And it seems that the CIA is signaling its, you know, thoroughgoing intention to be a part of that endeavor to to be the sort of enforcers of the new world order or at least to participate in it the the head of the cia recently suggested that the jury was right to convict chauvin in the name of of racial justice we've like this this video is not the only thing that makes it clear that they're thoroughly ready to be committed to you know stamping out uh, domestic extremism and and exporting like radical queer theory abroad. Like this is not a joke. It, it reminds us of another Angelo Cotavilla piece on the American mind, just like abolish the CIA, pointing out that this is basically, it's always basically been a front for policy enforcement. But this is like the, you know, if, if we're convinced of nothing else, if we, if we are a declining regime, a declining empire, on the one hand, like this empire, this regime is ascendant. It's kind of horrifying. What's incredible to me, uh, I, I, Someone who's been watching this, and you know, I remember during the uh, Iran Contra hearings, and you know, going back further in D.C. I mean, for so long, the identity of the left has been built around the idea that the FBI and the CIA and the rest of the intelligence community is, you know, deeply and small c constitutionally aligned against the forces of, of change and of progress. And that <laughs> there's an essential, the essential fight is between the left and these forces of reaction contained in, in the, the, the IC, the intelligence community. And, you know, whether that was ever true is one thing. I mean, remember, John Brennan is a Gus Hall voter. <laughs> um, Can you explain to everyone quickly who Gus Hall is? Uh, oh, Gus Hall was the um, you know perennial Communist Party candidate, right, right. and John Brennan. I mean, probably just you know as a kind of uh, arch sort of uh, you know gesture, voted for Gus Hall in 1976, right. and then of course he became the head of the CIA and was a you know clearly complicit in um, propagating the Russia hoax and probably in um, undermining the Trump presidency to, to as, as much as he could. But um, the reversal, so that the FBI, the CIA, these, these groups are completely on the side of, of Black Lives Matter, completely on the side of the, the woke, and totally aligned against any ver version of uh, anything that could remotely be called the right. I mean, this is a reversal in, in American politics that just strikes me as, as enormous, as like tidal, 
And I, you know, I don't know what the end result of it is going to be, but it's just shocking to hear during the, the during the Trump administration when you know during the Russia hearings and all of that to to listen to like lefties, like people practically like Ed Asner, you know, people <laughs> who believe that the CIA killed Kennedy, that you know, basically any any crime you could come up with had been committed by the CIA that they were now praising them for their good work in fighting Trump, it, it, it really blew my mind. Uh, I, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, there are people on the left like Glenn Greenwald who will you know, speak about the irony of this, but it's, uh, it's pretty weird. Well, there's no doubt that I get a kick even when it makes me sick. I get a kick out of watching the uh, the conspiracy theories that uh, Oliver Stone was applauded for uh, putting into his film about the JFK assassination, be magically transformed from uh, from amazingly bra- uh, brave and courageous um, to uh, to to terroristic and uh, indicative of white supremacy. Um, it's really really quite a feat of magic that has been done. Uh, but as far as the CIA is concerned, I can talk about Steve Saylor on this podcast. It sure. has nothing to do with race. Uh, Steve Saylor pointed out recently, um, in a way that I'd never heard quite so bluntly, but it makes you know makes perfect sense when you think about it, that the Cold War was a war for control over the global left. And you know, from a certain standpoint, if you were trying to size up the geopolitical situation coming out of the 1940s, you couldn't help but notice that um, extreme leftism had more or less swept the globe uh, as the European empires were collapsing and uh, Marxism of every description was on the rise throughout uh, Africa and Asia and parts of Latin America. Um, that was a geopolitical problem. And uh, the, the way that the, uh, you know, the, the nascent intelligence community and the, uh, and the defense industrial complex um, decided to approach uh, that problem um, was by competing for mindshare, competing for the hearts and minds of the the global left constituency. You know, and, and there are books that you can read about how uh, the way that the civil rights movement was orchestrated or played out um, had to do with had to do with American policymakers uh, wanting to show the world that, that America wasn't racist and how they felt like they were under pressure to demonstrate that they were more serious about equality than the communist countries. And bearing all of that in mind, it only makes sense in a curious way that now that China is completely off the table, now that Russia is completely off the table, uh, it's a smaller pie to fight over for influence. Um, you know, the intelligence community uh, is is doubling and tripling down on appealing to the very furthest left people, both in the United States and elsewhere. I mean, practically all that U.S. foreign policy has become is trying to just like start color revolutions or rainbow flag revolutions in foreign countries. That's kind of all they've got, and that's especially going to be the case after you know we extract from Afghanistan. I mean, you know, the Pentagon doesn't really want to fight any wars. The American people don't want to fight any wars. Uh, you know, the the Biden administration seems to be sleepwalking into some kind of confrontation with China that nobody wants. Um, and so really all they have to go off of is evangelical wokeism as a tool of statecraft and of, of international policy. Um, and, you know, the reality is that... <laughs> If you're an intelligence agency that is not trying to lure the sort of mentally broken and psychologically vulnerable onto your payroll, then, you know, as I say, you should probably be fired and replaced with someone who is willing to do that. This is an old, old tool of tradecraft. I mean, this goes all the way back to uh, to uh, Joseph Conrad's novel, The Secret Agent, where the, uh, the, the mentally retarded character is... Uh, recruited into planting a terrorist bomb at, uh, I think, right at the the Meridian um, in order to cause uh, some sort of international statement or problem. So, you know, this goes this goes way back. You can read your Le Carre, you can read whoever you want. Plenty of stories of, you know, of smart intelligence agents running assets who are among the dregs of society. And, uh, you know, this has happened in the U.S. too. You know, this this is something that the, the FBI and like various 
uh, you know, PDs are certainly not beneath um, availing themselves of people who can be controlled and exploited and uh, who are, you know, who are more than eager to accept the role of a handler into their lives. Um, you know, of course, the difference is that all this is being portrayed as like a great leap forward toward uh, utopia of social justice, where no matter how badly you've disfigured or damaged yourself, you will be not just have a seat at the table, but you will be in the pantheon of American greatness in the, the halls of true power, which, you know, our, the CIA would lead us to believe not really in Congress anymore, certainly not in state legislatures, but in the intelligence community. Um, the fact that they are willing and able to wrap in patriotism this um, extremely blackpilling descent into psychological manipulation and, you know, borderline abuse um, is, is something that should be shocking, but in the totality of the circumstances, isn't really that surprising. Don't, don't you guys think, though, that, I mean, one of the things that the video, the result of all this that you're talking about, and one of the things the video brings out is, it's just rank incompetence. I mean, I have no problem saying this, regardless of what people call me for saying it, but if you watch that video, I'll just say what anyone should be thinking, which is, this is not someone I would hire, and this is not someone I want working at the CIA. CIA. Any person who would make such a video talking about basically their own incompetence, um, is what I hear, and a kind of uh, unbelievable narcissism, as Tucker and other, others have pointed out, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm mentally ill. Sometimes I have feelings of, of uh, you know, imposter syndrome. And I don't, I don't want someone who has feelings of imposter syndrome working at the damn CIA. I don't want someone <laughs> mentally ill there. And I don't want someone who is willing to participate in a, that kind of PR, you know, talking about themselves that way in this narcissistic fashion. And so it did, does make me think that, I mean, and, and forgive me, I mean, my thoughts on the CIA are, are probably more radical than Oliver Stone at this point, but we have Angelo Cotavilla, our friend, uh, to, to blame for that and others. Angelo wrote a great piece that, that many people pick up every couple of months from, from the American mind. Um, if you just look up Abolish FISA or Angelo Cotavilla and CIA, you'll find it where he talks about how these problems have been going on for a long time. So I have very, very negative thoughts about them and we're all probably on their watch list already, so we can shut up about that. But when you see this, you do, I don't want to dare them, but when you look, when you look, when you watch this video, you think this is an incredibly powerful organization that will remain so. But if this is really more than PR, then we're going to have a, a kind of incompetence that's going to stymie their effectiveness as we move forward. And, and it also is a, um, a level of, um, you know, being out of touch that just is unbelievable. So it, it represents to me a kind of radical or, or almost not radical, a sharpening of the disparity, right? A sharpening oligarchy and its sort of Praetorian guard versus the rest of the world or the, or the rest of America. And, you know, maybe we have a very powerful oligarchic nation right now. So maybe that just continues and, and, uh, and tyrannizes America rather than small foreign countries. But I mean, the silver lining for me is just when you watch that, you think, this is laughable. This this showcases a kind of incompetence that should make anyone who who hates us a delight at at this kind of, this kind of corruption. I, I'm sure you know if I'm if I'm from China watching that. Obviously, I'm uh, I'm very I'm very happy. And same with any other enemies we have. You wonder if though sometimes if uh, the regime is not like rubbing our noses in its own filth. Like that, they like to pr promote, like the like to 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 demonstrate how mentally ill and corrupt they are, how full of lies, and and just the extent to which all of their lies are blatant, um, and almost to say, well, what are you going to do about it? Uh, I mean, I agree with you. It, it 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 would give comfort to our enemies to to see something like that. But they also know that it will derange their domestic enemies. And it almost seems like that's what they that's what they want. 
No, that's a, I mean, that's a great point. And it is, it is a piece of PR. So you can do whatever you want with that. You can construct or project whatever you want. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, the black pill uh, view would certainly be that they're rubbing noses in it. And that's certainly happening in almost every sector right now, you know, from the Facebook stuff on down, it's just, you know, rank, rank hypocrisy is the point. Demoralization is the point. We are woke. What are you going to do about it? You know, a finger to the rest of America. So fair enough. I, I guess, I guess I, but even then I push back a little, I'd say, well, they're still really dangerous and powerful. But when you look at someone like Brennan and Clapper, right after they leave, I mean, these are terrible human beings who can do a lot of damage. But I, I think this confidence problem uh, gives me hope that they're, they're, this, this sort of thing can't, can't go on forever. I mean, as you point out, Matt, I mean, many of the things that that person, that woman says in the video are not just sort of irrelevancies or, you know, woke boxes ticked. They're, they're actively disqualifications for serving in the CIA. I mean, she's been diagnosed, she says, with generalized anxiety disorder, for example, or she suffers continually from imposter syndrome, which I'm sorry, that toll concept is just a nice way of say, of assuaging yourself that you know you're not incompetent everybody feels incompetent but in fact like some people are just incompetent and shouldn't be in the roles that they're in and many people are in the roles that they're in you know because <laughs> since the civil rights act we have been like in the business in the national business of putting people uh, into positions and in places on the basis of our quotas and that's like a, a as you say, man, that's, it's a cancelable thing to say, but there we are. It's just, it's just true. And yeah, I, I don't know how much of this is posturing. I mean, you can't staff an entire intelligence agency just with sort of like chronically anxious single mother Latinas or whatever she is like. So presumably this is, they, they picked somebody who would, you know, really shove this stuff in our faces. But at a certain point, as I think some of us have pointed out, like it doesn't matter how sincere they are about this stuff and how, how much they're just doing it to like mess with our heads. Like this is a corrosive self-destructive ideology and it's uh, certainly aid and comfort to China and whoever else is watching that like we're just shooting ourselves in the foot in this way. Yeah. One, uh, one little piece of data, which I shared with some of you guys, uh, Maybe it was yesterday. I know you've all read it, but uh, it was worth rereading as Angela's piece. It's kind of an essay review of, um, of a bunch of books on Obama. And it's called The Chosen One, The Rise and Rise of Barack Obama. At, you can find it at claremontreviewbooks.com. Among other things, it, it takes up this question that James mentioned, which was uh, uh, Angela speculates. He basically says, you know, if, if one of these books is true about Obama's mother's mother, so his grandmother, who, you know, was an executive, a bank executive in Hawaii. It looks a lot like she was sort of involved in, in one of the levers that the CIA used in that battle for the control of the global left, which was um, financing abroad. Pretty interesting. But the whole piece is, is worth, worth revisiting. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know, Matt. I mean, I, I just wonder. I, want, I do wonder. I wonder how much this is just merely PR. And, you know, they, they might, the HR department at CIA probably has, has, uh, you know, a, a cohort of folks that it hires for those reasons and they put them up and put them forward. But you wonder uh, how much it actually is driving their real work. And then we re remember as well that Angelo Cotavilla has stressed for years, the main problem with the CIA is, um, you know, it, it, it's in the capital I intelligence business, but it has forever lacked lowercase I intelligence in the old sense. So, um, but that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. I mean, it can deploy its stupidity and mendacity to great effect around the world. And um, yeah, the, uh, and then taking up one of your points, Seth, it's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, it, it does seem like the State Department and the CIA, State Department's always been anti-American, at least going back a century, at least, or maybe a little less, but, and it's merging with the CIA, the, the cultures of the two places, I think, which was accelerated under Trump is remarkable. They used to be, you know, at mid-century, you would have called them really rivals in a way. Uh, the State Department wanted diplomacy and uh, talking, and the CIA was out, you know, 
uh, doing cloak and dagger stuff and black bag stuff and and uh, uh, not consulting, but just just running about doing its work. Uh, the, the the same ethos taking over both places uh, is an interesting development. Well, we've been. Pro- oh. oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Just uh, I just you know I was just trying to offer a little bit of a white pill, but <laughs> fair enough. Uh, I can't argue with that. No, but you're right that you're. I mean, the CIA, uh, corporate America, universities. I mean, th- I think we will we will start to see a real competence problem. I just wonder how much I, I talked a little bit with Mark Blitz about this, just to bring him up again. We were talking about higher education. You just wonder about how much the really elite institutions, and we ha- must consider CIA to be one. We were talking. Mark and I were talking about Harvard or the Ivies, the extent to which they. Because they're so prestigious, they will they you know they have a sop to these forces, but they'll continue to attract very smart and talented people uh, from all walks of life. And so, at least at the height of some of our institutions, the rot might be more gradual than we would hope. Uh, well, we've we've promised for weeks now to do a survey of the right and a sort of investigation of the different constituencies and institutions. I just want to lay out the kind of waterfront of it and then, um, gentlemen, you can riff however you like, and then we can sort of pick apart each piece of this, uh, every week going forward. But broadly speaking on the American right, and I'm talking really in terms of ideology, we can start with ideologies and we can talk about publications and then talk a little bit about think tanks. Cause I think there's a good portion of our audience. You know, I, it, this, this uh, request came to us because I, kept saying, you know, I listen to the dispatch podcast, so you don't have to, et cetera, et cetera. People I think who aren't in, in this line of work and don't immerse themselves in it have no idea of how all this shakes out. So let's start with, with, uh, ideology. So there's the neoconservatives. Um, these are now we're on third generation of neoconservatives. Now the first generation is really, uh, Bill Crystal's father, Irving Crystal. The first generation neocons m- more sensible than their uh, progeny in many ways and a little more impressive. They were, you know, uh, quanti- quantitatively based and sociologically based critics of the great society uh, welfare state, more or less. You know, they and then they sort of fell into. They were also anti-communists. So the um, the foreign policy wing of neoconserv the current generation of neoconservatives, they that is the current generation would like to trace it back to the sensible anti-communism of their of their. F- parents. Uh, where, where are these things housed? I mean, really Commentary Magazine, which is run by, edited by John Podhoritz, who's Norman Podhoritz's, uh, another first generation, uh, more or less neocon, Norman's son, John. The Foundation for Defense of Democracies is kind of the institutional, respectable um, uh, wing of neoconservative foreign policy. The Weekly Standard, until it died, at least in foreign policy, uh, it was a more more interesting magazine in the realm of ideas and domestic stuff than than it might get credit for from the Trumpy right these days. But its foreign policy was decidedly neoconservative. I mean, it was really founded for that reason uh, specifically, is you know to advance, among other things, um, a, an assertive and um, confident foreign policy uh, after the Cold War. Uh, Bill Crystal, of course ran it for many years. Uh, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the successors of the Weekly Standard, which collapsed, you know, which was shut down by its biggest benefactor, are really the bulwark and the dispatch. And the Washington Examiner is really the true successor. Washington Examiner and Weekly Standard uh, substantially funded by uh, Phil Anschutz. So that's the common thread there. Then we have paleocons. Um, they were, they're kind of old defenders of the South, but they're much, that's, that was a long time ago now. Uh, publications like the American Conservative and the Imaginative Conservative are, are places for paleocon thinking. Chronicles Magazine as well, uh, to a certain extent, a little more obscure publication. Um, the paleocons, you know, are skeptical. They're traditionalists. They're skeptical of abstract rights. They're not huge fans of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and they're, uh, they think, uh, a lot of them think that Lincoln uh, was a villain rather than a, than a hero. Uh, because he ushered in kind of rampant egalitarianism and expanded the uh, the federal government uh, in a in a big way, or unleashed the um, former restraints on our federal government. Then you have the the kind of the Christians and the evangelicals. The Family Research Council is the original the original uh, one here. I don't know the publication the publications for this crew as well, 
So I just know the institutions. You have our friends who are, I wouldn't call them just Christian, but they're culture warriors at the American Principles Project. And then you have the libertarians, Cato, Reason Magazine, the Koch umbrella, or uh, you know, the Koch organizations, Americans for Prosperity being the, probably the most prominent. And then you have these kind of critics of libertarians, the anti-libertarians as I'm calling them, centered at really two, two institutions, American Compass and American Affairs, American Affairs being the publication. So our friend Orrin Cass at American Compass you know, founded it to really critique the political economy of the libertarians and, and uh, argue for a political economy that looks after the middle class rather than just exalts abstract free markets. And then you have the alt-right or the dissident right. I mentioned Chronicles. It has some of that flavor. Uh, American Renaissance, which Jared Taylor founded, um, sort of focused on advocating for whites, for lack of a better term. That's how he'd put it. That's what they do. Tacky Magazine by this uh, eccentric and interesting Greek uh, Greek gentleman. And Vidare, which is uh, Peter Brimlow's outfit, and they, they focus on immigration more than anything else. And they have a bit of the flavor of sort of white advocacy that American Renaissance does. And I've left out the Federalist, which is kind of its own animal. I mean, Ben Dominich, its founder, has said uh, the National Review was built to win the Cold War, um, and uh, Ben wanted to build the Federalist to win the Culture War. It's kind of a hybrid. It's got some libertarians that work for it. It's pretty Christian uh, in the kind of low church sense. Just to, well, I'll just leave it at that. But, um, a lot of a lot of young libertarian-minded Christians uh, write for it, edit it. Some not so young, but they publish a lot. I mean, those. Are, a lot of you are probably familiar with it. I've mentioned a few think tanks, but let me just do the big ones now, and then we'll stop, and we can uh, talk about whatever we want and wrap up. But the Heritage Foundation, uh, which was is now, uh, I think, nearly 50 years old, not quite that old, 45, 46, was founded by Ed Fulner and, uh, and one of his colleagues. And they were, I think they were in some, they were staffers at the time, and, and they... I think someone from AEI was there and they had this great report and they're like, well, why, why are we getting this now? That vote on that topic already happened. We, the scholarship would have been great. We could have used it. And the AEI uh, representative there said, oh, we're not in the business of influencing politics. Uh, we can't actually deploy these things. We don't want to get involved or, or uh, be seen as that partisan. And so Ed and his uh, colleague, Paul Weyrich, founded the Her Heritage Foundation. Now about a million, hundred million dollar organization, uh, currently in its, in another leadership transition, the third or fourth it's had in the last seven years or so. So things in flux over there. Uh, AEI, of course, I think, well, you know, one of the older ones, I think it was founded in the forties and their, um, their foreign policy is, is kind of neoconservative. It's embodied by Danielle Pletka, one of their senior foreign policy bigwigs, who's an old, an old neocon and, and a Reagan era cold warrior. And then the Hudson Institute, which is, um, you know, a $20, $30 million think tank or so, not, not quite as big, a bit of the neocon flavor in foreign policy, but not exclusively. Um, our friend and very smart man, Chris DeMuth, who used to run American Enter Enterprise Institute, uh, he did for 20 years or so. He stopped about a decade ago, at least, if not 12 years ago. And uh, Chris is a, a smart man on policy, on the regulatory state, on the Electoral College um, a very sober-minded guy. He's he's one of their more prominent scholars, as well as Walter Russell Mead, who many of you may know from his foreign policy writing. writing. Uh, then there's Seth's uh, former employer, the Manhattan Institute, which is up there in New York. Um, I would say libertarian on economics to a certain extent, but that doesn't quite do. That's a little too cramped. Um, but does a lot on New York policy, but not only that. Prominently and interestingly, they just brought on as a senior fellow our friend Chris Rufo, who did our Lincoln Fellowship at Claremont uh, six, seven years ago. And uh, Chris has been making a lot of waves recently, working on uh, sort of combating and dismantling and raising the alarm about the spread of critical race theory and diversity and equity and inclusion efforts in the federal government and state governments at schools, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, City uh, City Journal is the main publication for the Manhattan Institute. Uh, I hadn't mentioned that one yet, and it's uh, it's policy focused. It's uh, edited wonderfully by Brian Anderson, uh, Seth's old boss, and uh, it's a very interesting publication. And then finally, the Trumpy think tanks, which are pretty new. Uh, that is to say, the Center for American Restoration, which is founded was founded. Uh, these are neither of these are more than a year old at this point. Uh, for obvious reasons, was founded by former OMB director under Trump, Russ Vaught, 
uh, Russ is a friend and former Lincoln Fellow at Claremont as well. And then America First Policy Institute, which was founded by Brooke Rollins, who was the former, was she president of TPPF or executive director? I forget. I think she, I think I forget her title, but she was running the Texas Public Policy Foundation, uh, the biggest of the state-based think tanks, fitting, fitting, because it's in Texas. Um, she ran domestic policy at the White House uh, in the last two years or so of the Trump administration, and she's now f um, founded America First Policy Institute, pulling in a lot of former former staffers staffers from the administration. From you know just reading it and looking at it, America First looks a little bigger than the Center for American Restoration, but um, uh, well, it'll be interesting to watch those two going forward. Well, that's for some publications and institutions. We'll, uh, we'll d dig into these a little deeper. Um, I will just mention, if you want to see Claremont's place in some of this, it's worth, um, it's worth looking or keeping an eye out for some of Glenn Elmer's writings of late with us. Uh, he's going to be writing, writing more about this. He has a, a new book coming out on Harry Jaffa in September, and um, it'll be a nice resource for some of the ideological fights uh, between Claremont and some of these factions going back. Uh, 40 years or so. Oh, I left out the youth organizations. Turning Point, run by Charlie Kirk, founded by Charlie Kirk. Now, you know, Charlie uh, will be a Lincoln Fellow this summer for Claremont. He uh, he uh, decided to forego college and to start this organization. And uh, it's now about a $30 million organization, so no slouch there. Uh, Young Americans for Freedom, YAF, which was founded by Buckley, you know, back in the, I think, the late 50s. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. And then the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, which focuses a lot on campuses and um, more intellectual than Turning Point um, in its mission. And uh, now run by Johnny Burka, who uh, before ISI was uh, executive director, I think was his title, at the American Conservative and the foundation there. So there's, uh, you know, ISI is kind of libertarian, kind of paleo libertarian. So um, maybe we'll uh, define in with a little more precision on our next uh, next podcast, what all these factions really believe, and uh, I'm sure we'll piss off every faction. But it's uh, it's a wild, wild world out there on the right, and uh, it's worth worth knowing all this stuff. But anything to add, anybody? Oh, I would I would just uh, stir the pot a little bit. Yeah, by, please, James. By throwing open the question of uh, who, if anyone, is the heir to the Whigs on the right today. <laughs> uh, the late great Whigs, once a very influential, powerful uh, factor in American politics, and of course by uh, 1860 they were nowhere to be found, or rather many places to be found uh, under a different cover. Nationalists, but also sort of meddlesome nationalists in their yeah. way, uh, you know, wanting to, to nationalize education and uh, always concerned that the, you know, the, the heartland was falling into a sort of... Uh, stagnation um and uh you know complex questions in any time but especially as we head into uh what's left of this bizarre century i do think from time to time that that some of these conflicts on the right sort of internecine squabbles and, and jockeying to to uh establish dominance on the field really just kind of unearthing uh, or or dragging back into the present some of the, the long unresolved issues that led to the demise of the Whigs. Interesting, James. So you, we should make a close study of the the decline and and dissolution of the Whig Party. Well, it, it, I mean, you know, this is a, a little bit out of my my uh, subject matter expertise, yeah. but you know, thinking back, it appeared that the the Whigs had had done a pretty good job <clears throat> of striking a kind of you know uh, nationalist consensus on uh, on economic sort of big, big picture econ economic matters, uh, cultural matters, political matters. And, uh, you know, although much of what brought about the demise of the Whigs had to do with the rise of the Free Soil Party and the, uh, you know, the, the split of, uh, of the, the Democrats into uh, Northern and Southern Flavors, um, I, I seem to recall that not all of the Whigs instantaneously became Republicans overnight. Right. Uh, but there were other issues too. And, uh, you know, I think that that in the in the collective memory, it was, you know, everything that happened 
between uh, the Missouri Compromise and, you know, one second ago can be explained by the fight over slavery and race in America. And, you know, that's not that's not the whole story, to be sure. Um, and some of these questions about, you know, how a large continental republic, a large continental commercial republic can effectively, uh, you know, promote the general welfare and and work toward a distinctly American common good, you know, that was kind of the Whigs bread and butter. And, uh, and those issues, as we all know, are, are alive and well today. Yeah, that, that's a, that's an interesting point, too, because it ties in with what uh, Charles Kessler likes to say, and, and Ryan said before on this podcast that the heir to that throne really was the old Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it wasn't that long ago, right? I mean, just just pre World War II, when um, the Republican Party still actually had a, a large element of of some of the aspects your James is talking about um, in terms of you know looking at a, a national common good and dealing especially with economic issues, um, realizing that uh, monopolistic corporations may not actually have America's good in mind and. <laughs> What's always good for them isn't good for everybody else. Crazy ideas like that. Um, so I, I, I think um, just hearing Ryan talk, I mean, I, I think what you're pointing to in a way, James, is uh, there just needs to be a different framing for all this. I don't know about anyone else listening to this, but if you are aware of these factions and groups, I mean, I have a hard time um, grappling with the relevance of, <laughs> of them all in the way that they've conceived themselves. And when we're going into a kind of regime level crisis, as we like to say, you know, we need something new that unites them that's much, much broader than what's been there in the past. Uh, And as a prosaic point, really, I mean, post Cold War, this kind of becomes obvious, you know, what unites, what unites the right. Hint to our enemies, it's not tiki torches. But it's something it's it's something beyond that, and it has to be something uh, related to a national common good, and an acknowledgement that this tension has has always been with us, and and so in that sense, you know, a lot of these debates about a new right, I mean, it, nothing's new under the sun, but if there is going to be a new right, it needs to harken back to some obvious, uh, larger scale kind of structural principles of what you can do with a political party in the United States of America. And, you know, I mean, the, the that nationalist side of the Whigs did live on. And uh, we, <laughs> I mean, I mean, we have a lot more to talk about in this podcast, because it, I think it's, it's very unclear what actually y- unites the right and the left in this kind of this t- time of uh, time of realignment. By the way, as you guys are all talking, I have this old copy of God Man at Yale, third <laughs> printing, and look, looking at that as the book that launches a young William F. Buckley to create a conservative movement and uh, unite unite the clans and all that as he went on. You know, it's just it's just striking. In a way, it's kind of small ball. In a way, it's not. I mean, he in a sense launches the conservative movement by saying, "Look, everyone at Yale." who's giving money to the place, right? This is in the forties. Don't realize that they're all godless communists who run it and they're all progs, right? They're all progressives and we're in a real bad way. And here we are, you know, 70 years later, things, things have just gotten worse. I'm going to stop myself there. (laughs) Yeah. That's a good place to stop. We'll have to figure out what, what we want this uh, final segment, which will continue for a while in these podcasts to, to look like next week, but we'll uh, we'll put our heads together and figure that out. I have left out, of course, and I'll apologize to uh, any of our listeners who are, you know, contributors to members of or, or partisans of um, the many good think tanks at the state level, or the kind of regional, more issue specific ones, uh, uh, like the Discovery Institute or the Heartland Institute. Uh, there, there are a bunch of them. Some of them run by friends, but uh, you know, we just get if we get too down into the minutia, uh, we'll lose the. Lose the uh, forest for the trees. So with that, uh, thank you all for listening to the roundtable. If you want to support our work, visit claremont.org slash donate. 
If you want to learn more about all our projects and writing, visit our websites at AmericanMind.org, Claremont.org, ClaremontReviewBooks.com, and our new Washington Center for the American Way of Life at DC.Claremont.org. Please rate, share, and subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Rate us well, please. It helps spread the word. And thanks, as always, to the production and engineering crew, Jake Gannon and Annalisa Lee. Thank you all for listening. Talk to you next week.